everyone. My name is Megan Sweary, and I will be moderating today. Um, I work at the Papa John Center for Entrepreneurship here at Iowa State, and we are hosting these, what we call the Start Something series, to hopefully help spark um, you to start something. So a little bit about this series. The one that we're doing this semester is all around the idea of side hustles. And so we've covered different types of side hustles and talked to people who have either who have been doing this as a side hustle or who maybe have taken this side hustle all the way to a full-time job or who just have experience in the space to share some tips and hopefully inspire you to pursue your own passions. So to get us started, first I just want to talk a little bit of etiquette for today. So we are recording this session to share on YouTube, so just keep that in mind if you have your video on. Um, and we also just ask that you stay muted and ask your questions of our panelists through the chat. So I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session today and asking the questions um, as they come up. So please utilize chat as we go throughout the session. And we have a lot to get through, so I'm not gonna waste any time and I'm gonna jump right into our panelists and have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about the type of reselling that they do. So Rochelle, you wanna get, get us started? Hi everyone. My name is Rochelle Guy and I am the creator and founder of the brand Rochelle Reloaded, where we promote individuality and sustainability through fashion. So what I do is I take unwanted, unused or thrifted items and I create new things out of them. And I've been doing it for the past three years, going on four years. And it really just started from my childhood. Um, I've always been creative and I always was into fashion, but I didn't have a lot of money to go shopping all the time. So I would just take things in my closet and I would transform them into something cool and unique. And I would just wear them out. And then once Instagram started, um, you know, popping off, I started posting them on Instagram and a little bit on my Facebook. And I realized that, oh, people really like what I'm doing and they have a genuine interest in it. So I continued doing it. And then um, once I got to college, I realized that maybe it's not um, a feasible option for me. Maybe I need to go into something else. So I kind of strayed away from it. But then luckily I regained my passion for it and I decided to create my brand. And ever since then, I never looked back and I'm excited to talk more about what I do in depth um, throughout this whole panel today. Awesome, thanks Michelle. Brady, you wanna go next? Sure, of course. So yeah, I'm Brady Trent. I graduated from Iowa State with a degree in mechanical engineering. And I run a few companies, the main one being top level suites. And you can see that here on the presentation. That's one of our uh, spectator suite units. And we actually set those up down at the Chiefs. Um, so it's, it's our main companies. We provide VIP experiences um, for top end clients and some unique sponsorship opportunities in advertisements. And it's a little bit different uh, sales strategy working with the Chiefs and uh, more service based business. So I'll try and stick to some of my side hustles where I've gotten a start into entrepreneurship actually with drop shipping, um, like t-shirts, for example. And then I have a couple other websites um, with a few business partners where we sell some physical products ranging from um, senior golf aids um, for like elderly golfers and uh, like up to docks, like floating docks, jet ski ports and things like that. Awesome. Thanks. Nate, you want to go next? Thanks, you bet. Uh, Nate Easter, uh, that picture there is from my my day job as operations manager at the Iowa State Research Park. But I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, basically storage wars, which is flipping items out of mini storage auctions. Um, got started maybe five or six years ago. Don't know. I don't remember the exact time when when Megan when you asked about you know a little bit of background but started there um, started in our driveway with a couple of friends saying oh man that show seems fun should we give that a shot and then started doing it and it turned into into more and more and a, a decent side hustle I don't it's nowhere close to what these other two are doing but sure happy to talk about um, what we've been able to do with with flipping some mini storage units awesome thanks so from here, we're gonna go through each of their kind of niches individually. So if you have specific questions about the, these type of 
reselling as we're talking through them, please add the, um, include those in the chat and we'll try and address those. So first we're gonna talk to Rochelle about this idea of like thrift flipping and where you, how you got started and what where you find your products. So usually I would just go around to thrift shops. Um, <clears throat> I started off just shopping at local thrift shops in Des Moines and Ames area. And then once I started traveling places, I would start going to thrift shops in um, different cities like Seattle, New York, because they had more um, more options and more quantity of items to look, um, purchase. And quickly after that, when people realized what I was doing, they're like, oh, do you take donations? Because people, you know, they have so many clothes and they're always looking for somewhere to um, donate it to. But um, I would educate them on, you know, like the Goodwills or the Salvation Army is that not all of the clothes that they donate will end up there. 85% of it will end up in the um, landfills. So for them, it was, um, it just made them feel better knowing that I was gonna do something with the clothes that they didn't want anymore. So that's that's a couple of places where um, I shopped. And what I look for when purchasing or when I am, when I get donations, I look at the quality, of course. Um, I just make sure that everything that I'm flipping is gonna stay, you know, of good quality for a long time because I want people to keep the item for a long time. I don't want them to throw them away or, you know, do whatever with them. So I would look at the fabric contents of it. Usually natural fibers would work the best. And if it is um, synthetic fibers, um, I'll just make sure that it wouldn't easily get teared or, you know, any type of destruct destructions to it. And, the current marketplace right now, market price. I'm not sure really what that question is asking, Megan. <laughs> um, that's okay. So I think the main thing, which I wonder when I watch people do this, is how do you decide, like when you're looking at products like at a Goodwill, for example, how do you decide which item will, will sell and people will be interested in? Is it just like you have a feeling for the taste based on your own or are there certain things that you look for? Yeah, so I make sure that the item matches my brand image and my brand image is bold, it's colorful. Um, I'm really into prints and patterns. So when I look at items, um, I just wanna make sure that it's gonna be cohesive with my brand image and that it is sending out the right message that corresponds with what I'm trying to um, you know, share with my audience. And also I look at trends that are going on currently. Um, I go onto Instagram or TikTok, Pinterest and look at, you know, what's popular right now? What are people really interested in? Because trends, you know, they come and go, but there are some things that stay for a very long time and that um, reoccur year after year. So those are the things that I mainly look at. If there are any questions about this type of reselling, please add them in the chat. I have one more question. Rochelle, I know you kind of revamp a lot of the product products that you find. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. A lot of people ask me questions on like, how do I start? Honestly, I just grab scissors and I just start cutting. I don't really think about, I don't really think about it much. The more that I think about it, the, the more harder it is for me to start. So yeah, I'll just, if I like the pattern, I'll just, I'll set my camera up and I'll just start cutting. And then eventually it'll start coming to me of what I wanna do. And then once I think of a design that I really like, I will duplicate that design with, you know, the other items that I have, if it, go, if it fits the theme. Um, but yeah, that's usually how my process goes because I just want it to be a fun experience. I don't really want to think about it too much um, at this stage. But once I scale up, of course, I'm going to start, you know, doing tech, um, tech packs and sending them to like a manufacturer to 
design to like manufacture my items but right now I just like having fun with it and people really seem to like it because it's something new every time and something that they've never seen before yeah you're super talented it's pretty impressive thank you somebody asked what is your favorite thrift store or stores in central Iowa my favorite thrift shop in Ames, it has to be Overflow. Um, I don't know, I don't know when they open, but maybe it was here my freshman year of college, but I never went into it until like recently. But I really like that um, thrift shop because the prices are very set. They have, you know, tags where you can easily identify how much it's gonna be. And they have a section for um, vintage fabrics there. So I, I literally splurge all the time. I walk in there, I wanna get all the fabrics cause it's fabrics from, you know, like the eighties, nineties. And those are the items that I'm really interested in because, you know, they're, they're timeless. People would always be interested in vintage items. And Des Moines, I really like DAV or DAV. It's on the east side of Des Moines and it's this huge um, thrift shop and they always have sales there. I remember one day I walked in there randomly. I didn't even read the sign outside, but everything was 50% off. So I, my total was like a hundred something. I ended up paying like 50 bucks. And I was, I was shook. So <laughs> I really, really liked that thrift shop. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move into storage unit auctions and Nate's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with those. Sure. So, Go ahead. Yeah. So first question, I mean, I think most of us have seen storage wars. So is that really what it's like in real life or how is it the same or different from the show? Generally the, the actual process is, is the same. Yes. It, it surprised me that you show up and they, they take a, take a uh, grinder to the padlock that's on there. They open it up, you get a certain amount of time limit to walk up to the edge of the to the edge of the unit. You can kind of look in. I have some tall friends that I like to bring along so they can see back there easier than I can. But it's generally the same thing. We don't have not quite the same drama or necessarily people you recognize. And I don't seem to get the same prices that they claim they can get on the show either. I think that's a thing that's pretty common in those flip shows, houses, storage wars, all that stuff. If I could get the prices that those guys claim they get on the TV show, I'd, I probably wouldn't be still working a day job. So but where to, where to find them? That's a, that's a good question there. It's, it's harder to find nowadays because there's so many places that people put them. There's websites that claim that they list all of the storage auctions but not everyone participates in those you know the people that own them have to be participating in them i think like the national franchise brands of storage auction or storage units i think put them on some of those but you miss a lot on those websites i still use the newspaper i don't think a lot of people read the public notices in the back so that's a thing that is a uh, I, I don't know if that's a secret or not because it's a public notice page but those things i think rarely get read i don't think people pick up a newspaper hardly any anymore. So by law, you have to put, you have to notify, if you're selling a storage unit, you have to notify, the owner has to notify the public. So that's a place where it, that happens. So if you keep an eye on those, that's a, that's a really good place that I don't think a lot of people look to find these. Um, and then now it's word of mouth people. I don't know if it's good or bad, but people know that few of us do this so they get a hold of us and say hey i heard there's one of these going on and we we find that stuff find it that way that's very cool so you said that you have to be on the edge of the unit so can you talk a little bit through like how that process is and how you know or what's the best way to know what you're yeah. getting and how to know how much you should place a bid for and kind of all that yeah that's a i mean it's all it's always a risk but you know, you go up there and I think it's more we found out what we know the bad things are rather than necessarily finding a, a good thing. So, you know, it, the easy stuff is easy. You see a brand new snowblower or something, you know, you've got something to sell. But what we really look for is 
things that are going to cost us bigger money. Like if there's a, bunch, a couple of fridges in there, we know we have to haul those away, pay extra money to get to get rid of those because there's an appliance deposit and that sort of thing when you throw throw those things away. If there's furniture or if there's garbage bags with stuff. Now I think I might have a different idea now that Rochelle is here because it's always full of clothes. And those are for us, for me and the people I do this with, we can't seem to get rid of clothes at all. So we have to donate them all. But that's probably because we don't have the same kind of talents. So when we see a bunch of garbage bags, that's a big red flag for us because that's more labor, we'll say, of going through all those clothes to try to find something good. So we we more look for what we stay away from because usually if there's a bunch of stuff like that, there's not as many good things in there. Um, you look for how they well they take care of stuff. If there's things broken in the unit, there's a lesser chance that people care about their stuff and there's anything valuable in there. If everything looks pretty nice, it's not dusty, it's fairly newer, then you got a pretty good chance of, of getting something good. And as far as price goes, I mean, that it just depends on, on where you are. Like if you do this in the Des Moines Metro or bigger cities than that, like Storage Wars, you pay a lot more than you do just around Ames and the smaller towns. I mean, we've paid as low as five bucks for a unit, but that down there in Des Moines, I mean, they're going for 2,500 bucks and more per unit. So just finding the, 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 <laughs> the couple guys that I do this with said, don't tell them where our best, <laughs> where our best storage units <laughs> are, but I mean, through small towns and throughout Iowa and throughout the Midwest, I mean, they're usually locally owned, so it doesn't take too long to get on their good side. And then they'll email you directly when, when auctions are happening. Because the people have to, I mean, the auction owners have to clean this thing out. And it's going to cost them way more to pay somebody to clean this out than if we show up. And even a low amount is still saving them money from the alternative. So, so you, if you get to know the owners and that sort of thing, that, that helps out a lot. Awesome. You shared a lot of good tips. Like if it's dusty or broken, I would have never thought of that, but that's a great point. Yeah, we didn't either, but we bought a large unit once and we, we've learned that just because it looks like there's a lot of stuff, that also means that's a lot of stuff to get rid of and it's, you have a lot more to throw away. Yeah. So somebody just asked, where do you sell the items to make money? Yeah, mostly it, I'll say the vast majority of stuff now we sell on Facebook Marketplace. So we don't, we're not organized enough to have, we don't have a business name. We're not, we're not doing it as, as often as I think these other two are. So, so it's mostly Facebook Marketplace. We used to do a lot more on eBay, even on Craigslist. Sometimes Craigslist is a little bit out there, but we sell things like if we find a, <laughs> we found a couple of uh, car engines and one that we had that were buried back there. So we went to Craigslist. We we're able to get rid of them on there because that seems like a place where unique things get sold. So, but by far and away, it's Facebook Marketplace anymore for us. And then we don't have to worry about shipping. Again, we probably don't make as much money as we could because we narrow down, narrow who we're selling to. But it's, it's our time, you know, how much time do we want to put on? doing this stuff as our side hustle. We definitely have lost, you know, I'm sure we could have made more money at this if we planned some stuff out and, and some other things we'll talk about later, probably. Awesome. Cool. If there's no more questions on this topic, we'll move over to drop shipping. And then like Nate kind of alluded to, we are going to talk about just some other general things that come with all of this reselling in general. Okay, so we'll hop in to Brady, and he can share drop shipping. Cool, cool. Yeah, drop shipping. This is, like I said at the beginning, where I got my original start into kind of the world of entrepreneurship. Um, drop shipping is is great because uh, you don't need any inventory, right? So you work with a a company um, that has products, and you have access to their entire list of inventory, um, and then you can, for example, set up a website and sell product on there. Um, and then they, you just send the order to them and then they ship it out and you take payment from the customer and then you send the uh, 
you know, the wholesale cost to the drop shipper, and then the customer gets their product and you make a little um, in the middle, um, up to about 50%. Most places are closer to 20% nowadays. Um, and there's so many different avenues to do this. A lot of people will just set up a Shopify store with things from um, like Alibaba, for example, coming from China, and they take six weeks to ship it. And I personally like to work with companies in the United States. Um, and actually, lately, I've been kind of getting out of the drop shipping space and into more inventory control, just to be able to have that and keep customers happy. Um, it's yeah, it's really about finding a good partnership, though, and finding products that sell um, is the number one thing that I would have to say. And then also with drop shipping, you can't do anything um, necessarily with Amazon, um, which is where I've moved a lot of my products as well, just because it's, it's so easy. So fulfillment by Amazon is you buy the product and you send it to Amazon and then they ship it out um, from there and you just get paid to pretty much mail one box in of, of product to Amazon, which is pretty nice. It uh, saves a lot of time and they take care of everything from there. So what, uh, I mean, I can ramble on about this forever, but. Uh, <laughs> Why don't we start with like, what product or company did you first start with? So if somebody is like, I don't, I barely even understand what drop shipping is, but I'm interested, yep. where would they start? Where did you so start? for me, it was, I actually wanted to get into like website design and I knew I wanted to start a, a business. So one thing I did was when I, I think I was 16 at the time, um, I, I just started looking for product. I, I was on page like 120 of Google of scrolling through all these companies that uh, do drop shipping. So it was, you know, probably about a thousand websites that I visited to find this one. And I actually started drop shipping some t-shirts um, and was able to set up a website and integrate my website with their inventory. So it had live um, updates on that. So if somebody placed an order, I knew I was fully confident that they would be getting a product um, and it would immediately send that order through. So yeah, t-shirts. Um, and then I have drop shipped some other uh, like golf products as well. Um, it's, it's really a lot of smaller items that you can package easily and ship out um, pretty inexpensively. So yeah, that's, that's where I've got my start, I guess, into business as a whole. <laughs> There was a question about how much of a concern supply chain volatility is within the drop shipping business. That's the reason why I've moved a lot of my stuff to my personal inventory so I can store it and ship it on my own. And I know my lead times, I know when I need to get product in and that I have it available to ship out. Um, there's, it, it depends on the industry that you're in. So with t-shirts, you know, if, if they sell out of one size, which is happens fairly commonly because they had, I think, um, like 10,000 SKUs. So one would go out of stock and you'd have to wait six weeks for that to get reprinted. Or if it was popular, it'd be two weeks. Um, it's, it's the bigger thing is not necessarily the volatility of it, but making sure that your inventory is in sync with their inventory so that you're not selling products that are actually out of stock. Cause that way you can run into a lot of pro problems. So setting up However, um, they integrate with your website is, is crucial. So where do you find these companies looking for partnerships with the drop shipper? Do you just reach out to companies that you see where you like their products? Or is there like a specific website that has a bunch of different people that you can partner with? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different resources um, that you can use the way that I would recommend doing it just because it's more interesting to me is finding potentially a local company. Um, you know, if I was in Ames or Des Moines, I would say I'd find some like a small local, maybe even like Rochelle and say, Hey, I want to be able to sell your products on, you know, a website, or I want to be able to send things into Amazon and have you kind of control that inventory and work that way and build a networking connection and relationship versus working with um, so just some manufacturer in China that's going to mail it and it's going to be cheap quality and a lot of headaches time frame wise. Um, sometimes people don't even get their things. So finding somebody that might not even be doing drop shipping is a good way to start. Actually, I'll add one more thing too. Um, it, there's a new service out there 
or relatively new. It's called on-demand printing. So for example, you can create designs. So I have another company that sells posters. We sell um, prints of like hiking trails. What's really cool with that is we design it, put it on our website, someone can order it, and then that gets printed and mailed out to them on demand. So there's zero inventory again, and we just take essentially a commission for these designs. Um, it's similar to drop shipping, but you can actually build your own um, products that are completely unique to you instead of trying to compete with all of these companies from China, for example. So when you do a drop shipping business, it's mostly about creating a customer base, right? So do you have any tips around that and how you have kind of made these successful businesses? The number one thing that I've learned, so I have a lot of different businesses from products to services. And the best thing that I figured out is that I'm not a great salesman, but I find products that naturally sell themselves, um, that people need, that they're searching for and that they want. So you can get organic SEO um, when people are searching for products and they kind of come to you is the number one thing. So when you're selling a t-shirt, for example, everyone's looking for a t-shirt, I guess, but they're not specifically searching your brand out. Um, whereas that's why I moved into like some golf products because it, it was very specific, picked a super niche market that I can hit all those keywords in Google SEO to build a customer base, be able to send them emails and have you know, genuine people interested in your company to be able to remarket to and target. Awesome. If you don't have any more questions, we will move forward just to talk in general and everybody can kind of pitch in in this section. So first, I just want each of you to tell us a little bit about which channels you sell on, whether that's your own website or Amazon or Facebook Marketplace. We kind of heard a little bit of these, but if everybody just kind of wants to take a turn and and say all the platforms that you sell right now. Rochelle, do you want to start? Let's go in yeah. the same order. <laughs> so I have a website. I sell through my website. I also sell through Instagram and Facebook. Those are my three um, channels that I sell from. And I, I, like I mentioned before, Facebook Marketplace is by far the, the place that we, we sell our stuff. Um, and eBay will sell, if it, like, for instance, we had one with a bunch of unique model, model trains, and they were easy for us to ship, and we thought we'd get a wider market than just the local Facebook Marketplace. So if we need to reach a, a wider audience, we'll go, we'll go to eBay to sell some things if we need to, and then mention Craigslist for the off the walls, off the wall stuff. I think that those two engines are the only time we ever did something on Craigslist and it worked. But Craigslist is a lot to manage because you get so much spam that it's just hard to, we don't, we don't like to deal with all that stuff that goes with that. Yep, and then I've listed on, man, I, there's everything. So uh, one that's not on here would be your own personal website, um, but eBay, uh, Amazon, it's something like Etsy for um, homemade products as well is, is really great. Facebook Marketplace, if you're trying to reach that local target audience, um, the, there's, there's so many different opportunities. I would definitely look into Etsy as well if, yeah, if you have something more homemade. Shout out anybody, if you weren't here last week for our Etsy section, session, we talked all about selling on Etsy and it's on YouTube. So. Thank you for the little shout out there, Brady. I don't even know if you did it, if you knew you nice. were doing it, but thank you. <laughs> awesome. So now let's talk a little bit about listing products. I, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of strategy. Um, so the first question I have is where, um, so when you're listing your products, do any of them, do any of you have products that already have photos and descriptions that come with them or are those things that you have to provide? With drop shipping, a lot of times you can get photos um, from the manufacturer and they will provide, you know, basic or generic descriptions. It's kind of up to you to spruce those up, especially if you're trying to sell on your own website, and create um, some actual content that people will be searching for. So that SEO, the search engine optimization. Um, and then I would recommend 
going a little further than that and really creating some uh, like unique videos. Video is kind of where everything's at nowadays that you can market on Instagram and Facebook that link back to whatever channel you're selling on, you know, Facebook marketplace or your website or Amazon. Yeah, I take all my photos, videos. Um, I pretty much do everything from scratch. Um, sometimes when I go thrifting for like fabrics, um, it don't, it doesn't have like the, you know, fabric contents of it or like the washing instructions or anything like that. So I have to do my research and I have to come up with, you know, the, the best um, way to describe the item. Um, and then for pricing, usually it it's a lot of different things that factor into the pricing. So, um, you know, the fabric content, um, the design, the time that it took to make the product. And also, you know, the perception of the customer, like how, how much do you think the customer is willing to pay for this? Because sometimes, you know, depending on like the fabric or depending on the style, some people are willing to pay a lot more for a sustainable product. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, it, it depends on the, the item, but as many photos as possible for Facebook Marketplace, I'm talking specifically to that. So to, every once in a while, I'll do a video, just if it's a, like mention a snowblower, we'll make sure show that it runs and that sort of thing that helps out. But photos of any, any blemishes or anything like that, we try to be upfront with that we got this at a storage unit auction. So we don't know that it works unless we show it in the video that it does. Um, pricing, we tend to start with something that we feel is outrageous. And if somebody gives it to us, that's great. And then it shows up, you know, when you edit the price, it's got a nice line through. And it, I think it helps people think they're getting a deal. So, if, you know, that's, a, that's something that we do. And um, when I list things, I'd go like, outrageous as well with the description. I spice something up. Like if I'm selling a satchel, I make up some story like, hey, are you an explorer or do you wish you would be? And then, you know, make a story like uh, Dora and Diego would be, would be jealous of this satchel and you could keep all your maps and classified info in there. And then at, after that, I describe the product and a little bit, you know, give the actual description of it. But what that does is it gets traffic going and gets people commenting on it so that it seems like whenever we do something like that, we sell stuff. No matter how crazy those stories are, it just gets people talking about it. So we do a lot of that as well. That's awesome. That's another really great tip. Um, so you kind of talked about it a little bit, Nate, but can you all talk about since most of these are used items, Brady, that might not always be, probably isn't usually true for drop shipping, but especially for like actual reselling of used products, how do you make sure that when you list the product, it's really clear so that you don't have a customer that gets something they didn't expect or maybe is disappointed with the quality? I, I can start, but I mean, I, I think on for sure every eBay and most I mean, Facebook Marketplace, I think you kind of know what you're getting there. It doesn't say new, but on eBay, in the description, every time I've sold something on eBay, I say this is from a storage unit auction. What I describe here is what you get. And if you have any questions, let me know before you buy. So it might hurt us a little bit. I don't know. But I just feel like then we don't have the problems in the end. But I'm not doing the same volume that the other two are probably doing. So it's a little easier for me to to say that and put that on stuff that I'm doing. Yeah, I always mention that where I got the item from, um, if it's thrifted, if it's donated, if wherever I got it from, I always mention that. I mention, um, I just try to richly describe the product. So how it feels, the weight of it, um, Let's see, like the comfort of it, if it's like um, how it feels. Um, yeah, I just, I just richly describe the item as best as I can. And if there's like blemishes on there too, I also, I always include that because I don't want somebody to, you know, be like, oh, this has a tiny rip in it or a little, a little tiny stain on it. I always make sure that um, 
somebody that they know what's going on. And usually I don't put it on like the surface. I usually like put it in the inside or like the outside or like try to hide it as best as I can. But usually it's not too noticeable for them to not want the product. Otherwise I wouldn't have sold it. Um, and I also take a lot of pictures from different angles. So I will flip it inside out. I will do a sideways, the bottom, the handles, like all the little details. I'll take pictures of it and I'll um, post that in my, um, in my listing. Yeah, I'll add a little bit. I, I like what yeah, both Nate and Rochelle said on that. Um, I think it's a lot about setting expectations, whether it's you know something used or new, you kind of under promise and over deliver on whatever you're doing. A, a, big, a good example is when you go to Aldi, you know, I, I walk in and I expect them to break at least three of my eggs. But if I go to high V and that happens, I'm gonna be really mad about it. So it's just letting people know what they're getting and, and then over delivering on that. That was a good analogy. Um, can you all, you, you've shared a lot about what you do for a product listing. Can you share like on average about how long it takes you to list a product? Cause it sounds like everybody's putting a lot of effort into that process. I, I can jump in. I, uh, I actually hired an intern recently to do this. So a graphic designer that I have do social media, um, promotions, advertising, and then also creating product descriptions as well. So it's, it's a lot of, it takes them a decent amount of time. Um, so the business I'm talking about, it's Trail Prints. That's our on-demand printing, where she will create um, some designs of hiking trails and then go through and scrape a lot of websites and create some really unique descriptions. It probably takes an afternoon to actually list one product, but it's going to be something that people are searching for um, that shows up when they don't even know that a product like this exists. So yeah, it takes some time for sure. Yeah, it's my least favorite thing to do. I honestly hate listing products <laughs> so much that I did hire an intern to and an assistant to do it for me because it was just taking up a lot of time. But um, I think my favorite thing from listings, taking the pictures, that's what I like to do and pricing it. Of course, that's going to be up to me, but I just tell them what to write and what to, what to do and they'll just do it because it's, it does take a, a long time. And especially if you want people to be interested in what you're selling, the description really matters because if you're vague about it, they're, they're just gonna be thinking like, okay, why should, why should I buy this product? Like what's in it for me? What's so different about it? If you're just posting the pictures, the words actually do matter when it comes to listing. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'll add on with one of your questions for for our stuff. If it's if it's over a week for for what I do, and a lot of it is because I don't have a place to put inventory besides all of our garages and our families don't like us taking up garage space with this stuff for too long. But if it's a week, we know it's not going to sell at the price we have it. We need to either move on with the price or move on to a different way of selling it for us but i it's probably different for the other for the other two awesome the last thing i want to talk about here is pricing i know everybody's kind of mentioned it but can you talk a little bit about all the things that you factor into pricing to make sure one that it sells but also that you're making a profit and that it's been worth your time and effort to list the product Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Mine's pretty straightforward. We'll just do, do a basic Google search for the items that we see and see what things are actually selling for and not necessarily what they're listing for. You can find stuff on eBay that's listing for pretty high price, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's selling. So we just try to find what things are selling for, go a little bit higher than that because people will always throw out lesser pricing and go from there is generally how we, how we list things. Um, I think I mentioned it a little bit before. There's many different things that factor into the pricing. Um, so like the, the cost of the material, um, the time spent on it, um, the design style of it, customer perception. Um, I feel like there's a couple more things that I'm missing, but 
for the most part, I have a base price that I start off with, and then I just add on to it depending on um, the item that I'm making. Yeah, and with drop shipping, it, as long as you're working with a reputable company, um, or you, you need to be able to hit a certain margin, there's this thing, it's called map pricing, so minimum advertised pricing. And that is set by the manufacturer and says you can't sell it for less than this or you can't have a coupon out um, to sell at this price. And it just keeps everybody kind of on the same playing field. It's the same concept of having, you know, distributors of if, if you're Dick's Sporting Goods, you know, you're, you have a, basically a set price and that's because they can't go any cheaper than that. It's just not possible. Um, it would break contracts and they wouldn't be able to sell things anymore. And that's the same for the small people. Awesome. So if anybody has questions, again, jump in the chat. I think you're starting to notice how different all of these are. They're all technically types of reselling, but all very different. Um, so the next area I want to talk about is marketing. And if you have an audience of your own, how you've created that, or if um, you don't, how you continue to sell these products and how you make sure that they're getting seen. So anybody can pitch in. Um, so I, yeah, I created a brand. Um, I think the brand came first and then everything else just came after. I just wanted an outlet to share my work. Um, so what I did was I created an Instagram. I just started posting my work on there. And then I decided that I wanted to start selling them. So I created a Facebook page to link to my Instagram. So I can do have the little tag, the shop. Um, tag feature and then I created my website and I would just constantly just share my work on all my social media platform and I created a personal brand that somebody can relate to and it took it took a while to get to where I am today where you know people all over the country know my brand and are shopping with me but it just takes consistency and it takes a lot of dedication and passion for what you do to create an audience that is, you know, going to be loyal to you and that is going to um, speak great on your name and develop that word of mouth um, marketing that's going to help grow your brand in the long run. I don't do any sort of marketing or have a brand except with the Facebook people that seem to enjoy when we have a listing up there and comment on the crazy descriptions. That's the only sort of brand we have, but otherwise we don't do any sort of marketing or anything. We're not consistent enough. Yeah, with drop shipping or anything online, it's, it's very crucial to develop a brand and it's a lot of uh, stems from the niche market that you choose um, that to, to basically enter into the market because those are the people that are going to be interested in your products. They're going to be interested in your brand and you're going to be able to send them, you know, newsletters with new product and anything like that. So it's, it's finding a product that kind of sells itself, finding that audience, um, whether it's online or, you know, locally, and then, remarketing to those people and make sure you service your clients, keep them up to date and interested. So kind of along those lines, when you are marketing or representing a product, do you, um, do your customers view it as your product or is it even within your descriptions and things? So Brady, for example, do you share that it's like a dropship product from X company or is it branded as your company? That is a good question. So a lot of the stuff that I do now is white label. So it looks like it's coming from my brand um, where I'm printed on the packing slip and it, everything comes back to me. It's sure the product might be coming from somewhere else, but it, it looks like it's me. And that's that basically it's called white label. Um, then you have other products that you can have a brand associated with. And that's where I've, I've gotten out of that just because there's so many other competitors trying to sell the exact same product as you are. Um, but in that situation, I wouldn't mention that you're drop shipping, but I would say, you know, it's like, here is their brand and, um, this is the product basically just give it to them as it is. Don't try and take that as your own. 
And Rochelle, you also kind of relabel things as your own, right? When you kind of revamp them. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I take off the labels. I have my own clothing labels that I sew onto the items. Um, I have my own packaging, think, you know, tank tags. So pretty much it's coming from Rochelle Reloaded. And I think it's so funny because people are like, oh, I'm wearing Reloaded all summer. And I'm like, yep, yes, you are. <laughs> it's really fun just to see how people react to um, the item. Like they don't even refer to it as a thrifted item. They just refer to it as like my brand's item. That's awesome. That's like a great picture of marketing and how you've really like made a business based on the branding that you, you've done. Nate, we had a specific question for you in chat. Somebody asked, how many auctions do you attend each month on average? And how many of them do you win the bid? And she said, it sounds like fun. Yeah, it, it, is, it is fun most of the time. And so if you get a bad unit, it's not as fun, but still, it can still generally be fun. Um, I don't know that there's an average that we attend per, per month. COVID has actually caused fewer auctions. So people aren't. Um, getting, I, I don't know if removed is the right word, but so there's a lot, a lot bigger extension on when you get, when you can sell a unit now because of COVID restrictions and things that have happened because of that. So there aren't as many auctions happening. There's more and more coming now. And we've also decided that this, and I guess me leading this, that it's not, we're not I'm not going to turn it into a full-time gig. So it depends if the weather's nice and some other things that will go to a lot more once it's outside of winter and we, you know, in the summer when our kids don't have much going on, we go to a lot more of these things than, than I do when the weather's crappy and I don't want to spend my time outside looking through stuff when it's, you know, below freezing and, and that sort of thing. So, it, I mean, you can go to, you can go to one almost every night if you wanted to in the summer, if you're in a bigger metro area, but you know, I'd say two a month is what we do in the summertime. Awesome. So next let's dive a little bit into inventory management. And first, I'm just wondering, how do you manage your inventory? Do you use a certain system? Do you just have a piece of paper? How do you handle all that? I have a sewing studio here in Ames, so that's where I store all my inventory. And um, when I get new items, I automatically take a picture of it and I put it in my photo album. So when I'm at home and I'm thinking about, you know, what am I gonna create for the week? I'll just pull out some items from my album and I'll do like a quick sketch or whatever. And then for the items that I already created and that I already listed, I would um, print out my CSV file from my website. And so I'll have um, all the items that I have on there and whatever sells, I'll just cross it off just like that. I don't really use Excel or anything like that. I just feel like it takes more time to like plug it all in and do all that. I'll just print it off from my website. Yeah, for uh, drop shipping, um, obviously the inventory is managed through uh, the manufacturer, the company themselves. So you have to stay in close tabs with that. Uh, I mentioned that a little earlier, making sure your website or system is set up to follow their inventory. So you're not selling things that are currently out of stock or um, placing back orders. And then in other businesses, um, I'll give one example. So we have our, uh, we have a dock business. So we sell these floating docks, jet ski ports. We actually just purchased a warehouse and uh, it's as rudimentary as an Excel sheet of what we have in inventory. And we just basically adjust the quantities when something goes out because it's you know, once a week you're moving, you know, six units, it's nothing too crazy. Um, whereas some other smaller products and more advanced multi-vendor tracking platform that you can manage between, you know, your website, Amazon, and um, some other locations to make sure your inventory is up to date across all those platforms um, is, is kind of necessary with higher quantities. 
Yeah, and we don't, I don't track inventory at all really, except when it's filling up a garage stall that somebody wants to park in and I get, <laughs> get in trouble like, hey, it's about time I can park my car in the garage. So get rid of this stuff. And we have a, uh, somebody else that does this with us has a um, electrical contracting business. So if they have some extra trailers or something that they're not using, we'll use that. The, the mini storage places that we have good, um, I guess, good relationship with, we'll work out a deal with how long we can keep stuff in the unit. Like a lot of times say you have to be out of there in 48 hours, but we'll work out deals like, okay, we'll take this unit that we wanted and we'll take the other unit we don't want, but give us an extra week to clean things out. So that way we sell out of the unit, use their space for the storage and then get rid of everything else after that. So kind of along those lines, how do you all move items that maybe aren't moving and what does that timeline look like? So how do you decide that it's time to change something to get it to move faster? And what are some of the tactics you use to move the product or sell it? I, I would say if you have um, kind of an advanced inventory tracking program, you can look at uh, like an aging inventory report and it'll basically say, hey, you've had this for six months, you're now losing money on it, just having it sitting on your books or uh, just paying for storage for it if you have something like that. And you just need to have a fire sale. That's <laughs> set. Use your uh, customer base that you know you've you've established. And um, if it's a small product, you can actually uh, create a coupon, for example, of you know spend fifty dollars get this included free. Um, just anything like that to move it off of your books and decide if you want to reorder more a different product um, from there. Yeah, I, to move products that I haven't sold, I just start going to like my personal network. I'll start posting on like my Snapchat or like my private story. And I'll tell my friends, hey guys, like I'm gonna sell this item to y'all for this price. It'll be like a discounted price just so I can get it out the way and just focus on like other items. Um, and usually they're up for it cause they're here to support me. They wanna support me. Um, but I, I have fun just, you know, sharing my stuff with people and they're usually up for, you know, trying it on or like purchasing it or giving it and giving it to somebody else who they think might want it. And that's usually how I do it. Awesome. Nate, we had another question for you in chat. They said, you mentioned looking in the newspaper, where else are auctions posted? Sure. So um, there's our website. So you can, I mean, if you go through a Google of trying to find these, there are websites that you you can find that some, like I mentioned, I think the like the franchise mini storage auctions in the bigger cities, they'll post them on a certain website or their own website. Um, but so you can find them that way. I would say by far and away, the majority of what we found has come through the public notice section of newspapers and then word of mouth after that. So we'll show up, You, most of the people that show up on these, you get talking to them like, hey, did you go to the one in Webster City last week? No, I didn't know they had one. Oh yeah, I'll let you know next time there is one. So you start going to these, there's a network of people. Nobody's, if you get to a bigger city, that's a little more cutthroat, but generally where we try to hang out is it's pretty friendly group of people. So, yeah, I mean, Googling is, is a way to find them. I just haven't, we just haven't found very good luck at getting ones that we like. I mean, you can find the popular ones on there, but that hasn't been our niche, I guess. All right, we're on to our last slide of content. So if people have questions, keep adding them in the chat. That's great. Um, so the last topic we're going to talk about is order fulfillment and customer management. So especially in a reselling of used items, you want to make sure that customers are happy and that they want to come back for more if you are creating a brand. So first, can anybody share maybe some shipping and packaging tips that they have learned through trial and error? Shipping and packaging is interesting. Um, if anyone wants to send me an email with like a specific question about that, that would be totally fine too. I think you'll have our contact 
info probably at the end here. Um, it's kind of unique for each situation. I use a few different platforms. Um, I typically buy like bubble mailers off of Amazon just because they're cheap. That way, print my own labels through something like PayPal. Um, it's like paypal.com slash ship. Now it's the same. You get the discounted like corporate rates, which is great. Um, but yeah, it's definitely need to look into that specific to your products and what you're doing. Awesome. Those are helpful tips. And then maybe does anybody have any examples of like a customer that maybe was unhappy and then a conversation you had kind of helped resolve that or what you've done if you've ever had a negative review or if you've gotten really positive reviews, how you've encouraged those and how you've used those um, in your business in the future to help make more sales and to be like a trusted vendor. For me, um, I don't think I ever had like a negative review, um, but I've had a lot of positive reviews. And what I do is I have a thank you note and it comes with like a 10% um, discount code for their next purchase. And then also I have a little message that says, um, tag us for a feature on our Instagram page. And usually people like to be featured on you know, business pages. So they'll take pictures of the, of the outfit or like the accessory, whatever that they got. And they'll write, you know, got my Rochelle Reloaded package and I'll post that on my Instagram. And once that happens, then other people are like wanting to do it because it's like, I don't know, it's like the cool thing to do, I guess, for customers nowadays to be featured on a business page. And yeah, I have a highlight reel on my Instagram as well, where I'll just, you know, highlight it to um, my page so then they can go back and see it and like other people can see all the reviews and all the um, items that I've sold. I, I'll talk at this somewhat the same about customer management, but somewhat different. I, since we're reselling different things each time, we don't necessarily have the same customer per se, but I think as far as managing customers and Facebook marketplace, when you're talking about pickup, we learned right away that you don't trust most of the people, maybe not most, but you don't trust some people that say, hey, I'll be there. You know, they message on Thursday. Hey, I'll be there Sunday afternoon at three. Hold this for me. I mean, pretty sure we found out right away, hey, when, if you're here first to come get it, it's yours. We're not waiting four days for you to say you're going to show up and then, oh, whoops, I actually can't get there anymore. But trust me, I'll be there three days from now. So we've moved away from all that stuff that we initially thought we were being nice right away. And we just say, hey, you, come, you get here first, it's yours. For me, customer management, I'm trying to think of a good story. There's there's a lot that come to mind. I don't know if I'll share any of them, though, but you, you got to take care of the uh, anything from the sweet old lady to uh, the terrible Karen. Um, you just don't want bad noise coming into your business. So just take care of them the same way that Amazon would take care of their customers. That's my advice. Awesome. Well, we're just about out of time. If there are more questions, go ahead and add them in chat. Um, like Brady mentioned, here's everybody's contact information. And if you have questions after the fact, I'm sure all of them would be happy to help you where they can. This recording will also be sent out to you after the session is done and it'll be on YouTube. We'll give you some cliff notes and also these slides. So if you wanna reference back, you have everything available to you. Um, the bottom email, here, the info at ISU PJ Center, that's us at the Papa John Center. If you want more one-on-one -on -one help with your business or you're interested in any of our other events that we put on, feel free to reach out to us there. And next week, we're actually doing another one of these Start Something workshops, and we're going to cover all things technical consulting, so the side hustle of consulting. So I will kind of pause if there's any last questions. Otherwise, thank you so much to our panelists and thank you to everybody for tuning in. This was great. We're getting some thank yous, but I think we might.
not have any more questions. So thank you so much to all three of you. That was great. I appreciate it.